Okay, on behalf of Santa Barbara City College's Earth and Planetary Science Department and the Security Division of, uh, of the campus here and of the administration, I'd like to welcome you here for a class designed to help you guys in the event of an earthquake. So this is part of the earthquake drill. And one of the things that's paramount is coming up with a way to teach you how to learn something that's very usable in your life. And of course, if there is a disaster, being able to deal with people being hurt, students being hurt. And as a parent myself, we've got all these kids here that, you know, parents are assuming that we're going to take care of them. And so I'm going to teach you guys how to do just that. Start Triage was developed by the Newport Beach Fire Department years and years and years ago as a means of being able to save lives. Um, the key here is how to assess an injured victim under one minute. Number one. Number two, how to use bystanders or people that aren't severely injured to be able to assist in the rapid treatment of severely injured patients. How to use what's called RPM for start triage. And in the event that we have triage tags, then you, will also, you would understand what those mean. There's four categories of colors that we use to denote various levels of injuries we'll discuss. And the start is the answer to the rescuer, us, for what do I do now? This something as bad has happened. What can I do to make a difference in somebody's life? Now, in real world, my assessment as a fire captain paramedic retired. When I did this for a living and I just retired, it takes 15 seconds per person to do this thing. This thing called start triage, where we go into a bus accident with 40 victims within a, uh, less than two or you know five, six minutes, we've got a pretty good idea of who goes first, who goes second, and we could do simple things that will make a difference in saving somebody's life. So directing walking wounded away from the uh, scene to reduce the number of people will be the first thing. So here's how it works. Start triage uses three things that you are, uh, th three things you're going to remember. Color coding, black, red, yellow, and green. It uses uh, RPM, which stands for respirations, perfusion, and mental status. RPM, respirations, perfusion, mental status. And then the acronym or the numbers 32 can do. So everybody say RPM. RPM. Everybody say respirations. respirations. Perfusion. perfusion. And finally, mental, mental status. So the numbers that correlate with that is, everybody say 30, 30 two, two, can do. Can do. So here's how it works. We have this incident that occurs, and the first thing we're going to do is, everybody that can hear me, I want you to walk over to that tree. So if you're on the highway, you know, I want to get you off the highway, and we've got a bunch of people walking around, the walking wounded, maybe they're not hurt at all. I want you to go over there. And so what happens is the majority of people go, okay. And they go walking. Okay, now I'm left with just the people, um, uh, reducing the number of people that I'm going to have to assess. Okay, because they, they may not be able to follow commands or they're injured and they can't get up. So when you use the start triage, it starts where you're standing. The first person you come across, you then go for R. R stands for? respirations. So the first thing is, are they breathing? Okay, so if they're not breathing, it could just be a matter of repositioning their airway. So if you reposition their airway, and I'm not getting into any uh, uh, difficult emergency medical uh, procedures and training and whatnot, this is just very, very basic stuff. So if we can reposition their airway and they start breathing again, then that person will be what's called a red tag. Okay, they'll have a red tag attached to them because there was a reason why they weren't breathing and I'm gonna make sure that they're evaluated and assessed as I build this medical organization and we get the ambulance coming in, you know, things like that. Continuing for respirations, 
the 32 can do. 30 means that if they're breathing more than 30 times a minute, and what's normal breathing? Between 12 and 20, give or take, okay? If you were to count your respirations, okay? Between 12 and 20 is normal. And you could tell, <sighs> that's over 30, okay? So something's going on. And you can now equate to watching a soap opera or actually seeing somebody that's hurt and know that something's going on. And you've been in pain before, okay? <sighs> oh boy, something's wrong. Over 30, that's an immediate red tag person. If it's less than 30, it's normal then. Awesome. Next thing is perfusion. How are they perfusing? And the thing that we use for that is the nail bed. So I want you to take a look at your nail bed and I want you to pinch and hold it, okay, and let go. How long does it take before it turns pink again? Less than two seconds, okay? 32, two. Two seconds or less, you're normal. But if it takes longer, what's happening is your body knows that the heart needs oxygenated blood, your lungs do, your kidneys do, your brain does, and so it starts shutting down your distal circulation to kind of shunt it and protect the core, okay? So the, it, it's, it's shown by just not that, but if you pinch the top of your skin and it stays up, it's called tenting. If you look at the veins on top of your hand and they stay flat, just visually, that's called dorsal venous collapse, venous like a dorsal fin, okay? And then uh, cold and sweaty and the uh, pale color. I mean, these are things that you can see. So the perfusion, is their radial pulse absent? Uh-oh, they may, maybe they're bleeding. So you might be able to do something just to control bleeding right then and there. So possibly, and, and by the way, when people do get hurt, if, if this is my lady here, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to leave her. Trust me. You tell me to go wherever you want, sure, right. I'm staying right here. So if, if she's bleeding, okay, then, and I'm not hurt, and, and I, somebody comes and says, okay, I want you to put direct pressure, okay, that alone could save somebody's life, okay, direct pressure. So... But then again, if they, you know, control bleeding, they're going to have to go to the hospital too or get medical care very quickly, okay? So that's a very important consideration. If the radial pulse is present, then, and, and they, they have good pulse, then you go to the mental status. Can you follow simple commands? What's your name? What day is it? Can you go, you know, or they couldn't follow my directions to go over yonder, okay? Then there's a problem with not being able to follow simple commands or can't follow it. If they can't follow any commands, they're an immediate. If they can follow simple commands and they do have broken bones and whatnot, they're, they're delayed. Okay, I'll get back to you. Okay, I need to get, take care of the people first. So your, your, your priorities here are to find the most likely people to die. Okay, and we've identified that. And then bringing some sort of medical organization to the scene. So, what we're going to do now is, this is all the training you get, I'm now going to assess you. You're all, many people are teachers here. Four steps of teaching, motivate, prepare, apply, and evaluate. Now we're going to apply it and evaluate at the same time. So, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one. Two, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Did you get a number yet? No. One, two, three. They're leaving. And you're good. Okay. All the ones go over here. All the twos over here. All the threes over here. All the fours over here. All the fives over here. Quickly, quickly, get your teams together, get your response teams together. Okay, I now want you to respond. We've had an earthquake. Threes are right there. She's a red tag. Okay, I want your groups now to go assess those patients. You've got five minutes. Five minutes. So your patients are on the lawn over there. I want you to find out whether they're a red tag, a green tag, or a yellow tag, or a black tag. 
Respond. All the victims are over there, the kids that are under the tree. And they've got cards, and they're, you're going to be able to find out what the vitals are based on RPM. It's that simple. So just head over that way, and you could, you could uh, you know, get your leaders. Bottom line is, she's still not breathing. We're going to do a head and tail chin lift real quick. If she starts breathing, all we need to do is just place, place her like that or get somebody to hold her airway open. If she doesn't start breathing with that, she's a black tag if you move on and she's dead. Yeah. Do you start breathing when we open your airway? Then you're black tag and she's dead. If she, if she was an isolated person in an accident and if she was only one, we'd be working on her. But we can't work on her because she's not breathing, so she's dead. We just move on. Black tag and move on. No respirations. No respirations. No pulse. No pulse. No response. So she is. No water. Well, no, but she's not breathing. So the one thing you can do is you yeah. can try and open her airway. Yeah. And see if she starts breathing. Okay. If she doesn't start breathing, yeah. she's dead. Okay, you don't do mouth to mouth. No, or anything we don't like have time. No, nope, because okay. it takes too long. Okay. No, it's, it, you should be able to triage all these people in about five, maybe ten minutes. Oh, really? Because here's the problem. If I spend a whole bunch of time with her, yeah, you're wasting it well, I'm somebody. wasting it, but the problem is if that person way over there, yeah. all they needed was their airway open, and it yeah. takes me 20 minutes to get there, yeah. she's dead. Yeah. Okay. I want to get there as soon as I can so that I can't, yeah. and then I'll come back and work with them later. Yeah. That's why it's so important to start off with the, anybody that can get up and walk, get out of here so we don't have to trip. So we don't mess with them. Yeah, you can walk out with a broken arm. You can, you can be missing a limb. If you can get up and walk, you're a green tag. It green. doesn't matter what it is. Green. That's green. Minor? That, that's minor. Because they, you could be missing your arm and walk out and be a green tag. The reason being, you're following commands. It's rare that that would happen, but the point is, you're taking. You're, they're out of the scene. We'll reassess them later and figure out they'll be a red tag. But you can't. The best people to do triage are people exactly like you. Do exactly as you're told to do. The worst people at triage are doctors, paramedics, and nurses because we put too much effort into it. We start, oh, we can do this and we can do, it, and it takes too long. You want to just get somebody who just d follows the script and that's it. What else do we have? Yeah, just to triage and figure out what's going on. Sure, triage plays a part in every action where there's more than one person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, he's a walking person? Yeah, you walk? A... You're green. <laughs> so what did we figure out over here? What would you guys figure out over here? Good. And you can have him hold pressure on it too. It doesn't really matter. But he can't follow me. So, so what is he? So we're bound to So he's an immediate, right. Yeah. He's immediate. He's immediate. He's immediate. As I told them over there, the important thing to understand is that they can follow commands and get up and walk, they're a green tag. It doesn't matter whether they're missing an arm. They're still a green tag. It doesn't matter. As I, told, as I also told them, the worst people to do triage are doctors, paramedics, and nurses. Because we always want to do more. Yeah. Huh? What? His feet is six seconds. Okay, so that means his circulation is poor, so he's a red tag. We don't even have to go any further. Okay. As soon as you reach that point, you're yep. done. You move on to the next person. I don't even care what his level of consciousness is anymore. He's breathing, but his, his circulation is more than two seconds. He's a red tag. You move to the next person. That took what? 15 seconds yeah. to do? Yeah. And then we move on to this guy. Okay. Two seconds. He's breathing, but he can't follow commands. He's a red tag. Move on. You tear off the red tag thing. Real triage tags have a way to tear off a thing and throw it on top of them, and you tie it around their arm or their leg. Something's happening on campus. We don't have any tags. How do we keep people from being triaged over and over? And over. Well, they're going to constantly be re-triaged, re but the thing is that triage tags definitely help. But the other thing too is if there's only like four or five people, you can sit there and go, okay, remember he's a red tag, or you can, you know, mark him somehow. We just but, have to figure out a way to mark him. Right. The best thing to do is to get triage tags. That's would be the best for sure. We, don't, we need them in our emergency kit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. In our in our safety bags, we have masking tape. Uh, you could sit there and do that. Sure. You could put red, green. Well, green will be easy. Just anybody that walks is green. So. But masking tape. Masking that works. Tape. But the better thing to do is order some triage tags, as you can tear off things and you can track of who you have.
The biggest mistake people make when they triage too with the triage tags is they tear off the tags and then they throw the part they tore off on the ground. You need to keep that with you so that when you go back to the main tent and say, look, I have, you can pull out all your tags and go, look, I have 35 patients. Register them. Exactly. So you got to keep those tags with you. Look, he's all better. These guys will get this whole lecture here when we start triaging in a few weeks. Okay. So. They're twins, so I've been yeah, it's okay. to be an organ donor. Yeah, which one's older? <laughs> okay, so we're going to save him. And <laughs> <laughs> the eldest always gets the best. <laughs> they pay the most taxes. <laughs> okay, uh, student victims. How did it go? Were they were they accurate in their assessment? Yeah. Was there any problems? No. No. Okay, people that actually did the triaging and you actually used the information in your cheat cards. Did you have any problems? No problems? I talked to one lady that had to leave and she said, I'm a little confused. I go, what's that? And she goes, well, people weren't doing what I told them to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like having a class at City College. It's like herding cats sometimes. Okay, so it, it could be a little bit difficult. And if you're dealing with somebody that's hurt, you're assigning somebody to stay with them, you're doing your best to be able to you know, assess people and do what's necessary to save a life. So with the skill set that you've just learned and with your refresher card, you're on the money. Okay, uh, Eric, where are you? Okay. Okay, the, what's going to happen next is we're going to do a brief uh, discussion. Designated evacuation areas are located. And then after that, we're going to have a, a tour of our, our Wooly, which is our mobile command post that has all these great things. Yes. Okay, if I could have everybody's attention. I'm going to talk about the evacuation zones. So on this campus, we have designated zones for students and staff to evacuate to during an emergency, such as an earthquake, a fire, a gas leak. These are zones A through F are located in areas that allow people to evacuate to in a safe uh, location away from uh, tall buildings or emergency uh, uh, vehicles coming onto campus. Uh, just basically getting away from busy traffic. Now these zones, A through F, uh, administration building, auto quad and marine tech, there's two different sites that you can evacuate to for zone A. One of the, uh, zone A is located near the east campus front entrance, right as you're coming into the campus. And then the other location, zone A, is located on the second floor of the administration building, uh, near the bike corral, motorcycle corral, where the EMT students all practice their drills. So there's two locations for you to evacuate to for the administration building. Zone B, that's this area right here, the student service courtyard. And that's for buildings such as the Student Service Building, uh, the um, ECLC Building 1 and 2, uh, Physical Science Building, ESL Building. So this is the area that you come to to get away from any uh, you know, emergency uh, situation. Zone C. There's two different areas for Zone C. For the uh, EBS Building, the north side, you would evacuate to uh, the uh, corner of the uh, PS 101 where the smoking area is. That's a, a clear area for people to come down the stairs and evacuate to. For the people that are facing the, on the south side of the building, EBS building, you'd evacuate to uh, the zone that's behind the bookstore where the uh, temporary buildings are all uh, located as well as those that are in the bookstore and also the first level of the campus center. So that's a, a, a very uh, safe area. The buildings around are very uh, low level. They're not going to topple over. So you can gather there. Zone D, that is for the PE building and, uh, and those that are down at the track, the stadium. You want to evacuate to a high ground, especially if it's an earthquake. 
because there could be a, a tsunami warning. And if a tsunami comes, then that's definitely the bad area to be in. So you want to evacuate to the high grounds and get away from that. And uh, it's just at the upper area, upper entrance of the uh, stadium. Uh, zone E, that is over by the international office where the smoking bench, uh, smoking bench is. And that is for people that are in the humanities building, uh, second floor of the campus center, and then all the uh, temporary buildings that are located in that area. And then Zone F, that is for all of West Campus to evacuate to the West Campus Bluff area. Big, wide, grassy, open area, and so plenty of room for people to gather. Now when you evacuate to any of these locations, you want to allow time for an instructor or the safety marshal, building marshal, zone marshals to come around and take role so that we know, you know who got out of the building and who may possibly be still in the building. So very important to, uh, to go to those zones and be accounted for. Now just because you have a particular uh, zone that you're designated for, doesn't mean that you have to show up to that particular zone. If there is a um, disaster where you cannot get to that particular zone, then you go to the next safest location you can. So, you know, do whatever is the safest, most direct route for you to get to. Are there any questions? Here. Yes. Um, are these are, is it posted anywhere? Does this, is there anything that says Zone A? Yes. Physical yeah, campus. Serious. Good question. So the signs are like this, and we have one. Well, you can't see it, but it's on the back of that light pole. But this is a uh, extra sign uh, for Zone D. But this is what they look like. They're mounted up high on light poles, and uh, easy to recognize. So yes. Any other questions? Yes. Are the floor marshals supposed to stay with their evacuation site until the other marshals come by for uh, counting attendance? Or are the zone marshals um, just to keep getting people out of the building and into their uh, site? As a floor or safety marshal, we don't expect you to be heroes or rescuers. You, know, you do what you can to get people out of the building as you're moving out yourself. So if it's a, say a fire alarm goes off and you don't see or smell smoke, then that gives you some time to put on your jacket, your vest, and then move through the building and let people know, hey, we got an alarm going off, got to evacuate out. You also have a, a whistle and a flashlight in your bag, so you can use those. Fire alarm is going off, it's going to be very loud, so to get people's attention, you may need to blow the whistle. Uh, if it's dark, you know, use your flashlight. But if you see or smell smoke, we don't expect you to go climbing through the building trying to get people out. You're just yelling, using your whistle to get people out as you're moving out yourself. And then once you get people out there, then you take charge in gathering, you know, getting their names for roll to, so that you can pass that on to zone marshals and also the security officers coming around. Yes? if we should have one of these backpacks, but don't. That would be me. Okay. So, yes, we're going to make an uh, extra effort to get around to everybody this uh, semester and get those who are designated as safety marshals your uh, emergency uh, kit bag. Should we email you if we don't have them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, email me. Okay? All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, our last section here I'd like to introduce, but doesn't really need any introduction. Phil Harz. <laughs> Thank you. For, uh, I've been so fortunate. To have a job in my life and uh, be surrounded by so many uh, young people and, and such good good friends and all the help that I've gotten in, in so many different areas on campus. But you know, welcome to the, the mobile city. Um, uh, you know, I've been very concerned uh, with the possibility, actually, the likelihood of having a, a major earthquake. And um, it, it, you know, I watched a lot of the size, seismic data, uh, and uh, it certainly is scary. 
uh, the potential that we have on the San Andreas Fault and, and some of the local faults in, in our area. And so uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to learn how to do the triage and, and to, uh, to get a guidance as where to have our students go uh, you know, when we do have an event. And I, I hope that you would take the time to walk around and look at the, the woolly. The, the first exercise that we did, we actually had everybody set up the woolly. And, and this time is we felt like, well, people don't need to learn how to set up tables. But uh, this would probably would be the area that we would set up uh, our, our field kitchen and probably some of the medical stuff. Uh, so that if you walk around, at least you get an idea of, of how things would be set up. And, and uh, this whole kitchen, uh, this is what we call the mobile uh, city because we can t set this up and we have our lanterns and latrines that we set up. And, and, and uh, we have also uh, setups for if it's raining with our awnings and we have these wings that we can set up. And, uh, but at any rate, it, it's nice that, that we have this on campus for when we do have an, a, a disaster. So. Uh, and uh, eventually I, I hope that the school can move forward to do this. I don't know if any of you have taken CERT training for different communities. I've done the CERT training for Carpinteria and they have CERT training for, uh, which is an emergency response team. But uh, eventually this, uh, the fire, city fire is, is offered to set up a CERT training specific to, to our campus. So it would be training uh, going through, uh, you know, rescue operations for buildings and the thing. And so I, I, my goal would be that the school would continue to, to do this. But anyway, thank you for uh, coming and, uh, you know, uh, it's been fun. And I would like to introduce you to the, the new mayor of the mobile city. Hi. <laughs> this is uh, Kevin. And Kevin's just the, the perfect clone uh, for Bill Harz to come over and, and oh, thank, <laughs> to, you know. Thank you. No, no, I, my name's Kevin McNichol and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to try and fill <laughs> oh, yeah. which is an impossible task, as you all know. Um, Bill's last day is unfortunately tomorrow. So I, I'm leaping out on leap year. But he's, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be gone four years and only be a year. But we expect, <laughs> we expect to see him around a lot, so. Yeah. But one thing that Bill didn't mention is this whole setup came from him. Uh, when he started this department, there was nothing, okay? And he built this piece by piece to the wonderful, you know, not only emergency response unit that it is, but to help support this wonderful field program that you probably all know with the Earth Sciences Department, that we go on these great field trips and supported by the uh, culinary department as well. So, Yay. let's all give Bill oh. a round of applause. <laughs> okay. all right. All right. Together. All right. Well, thank you very much. Because yeah. it's it I truly mean, is, and we're going to take a tour right now. But you'll just marvel at all of the things that he was able to put together. So, Luis is back in the back of we affectionately call the the truck the Wooly. So, head on back to Luis, and we'll be, commence the tour. Yeah, they can go forward. <laughs> <laughs> 